This farmhouse style wood sign is made completely from scratch. Want to learn how to make your own? Keep watching. Hey everyone, thanks for clicking onto this video. If you're new to my channel, my name is Katie Fallinger, and here you will find all sorts of DIY tutorials and ideas, all to make your home your happiest place. We cover everything from woodworking to home decor to life hacks. So if that is your thing, consider subscribing so you can catch new videos every single week. So today we continue with part two of a series all about how to make this. What you're looking at is totally handmade. I built the frame, the sign itself, and designed the stencil as well. So part one covered the woodworking and now I'm going to show you how to make the stencil and also all the finishing steps. If you watched part one you know I mentioned I had some trial and error on this project so I want to show you the biggest flub that I made right off the bat. Let's get in close here. This roughed up weathered texture was not supposed to be there but I embraced the mistake and made it work. So by the end of this video, you're going to leave not only knowing how to make your own sign, but also knowing what will and will not work. Okay, we'll start off like always with a list of materials and tools. And there's also a link in the description that'll point you to a full shopping list of what I used. That way you don't have to take notes. For this part of the project, I'm using my Cricut Maker Machine, a 12 by 24 inch Cricut mat. This is the light grip mat. Removable vinyl. This is the Aura Mask 813 a paper trimmer, weeder, scraper, transfer tape, chalk paint in a color of your choice, a decorative glaze, a sponge brush, synthetic paintbrush, and a sawtooth hanger, hammer, tape measure, and a small nail. Now a lot of the materials I use for this project are things that I reach for all the time and there are certain things that you always want to have on hand as a DIYer. So I created a DIY must-have checklist. It's 19 items that I always have in my inventory because I reach for them so much. You can grab that down in the description. So the first thing we're going to do is design our stencil and that's where the Cricut machine comes in. Now I've done a lot of other projects involving the Cricut and I have an entire playlist on that so I'll link that up here in the cards and then also down in the description but i haven't yet done a deep dive into the process that's involved in making these vinyl stencils so a lot of people watched some of these videos and then i got a lot of questions afterward like i kind of get it but can you go a little bit deeper into that process that kind of stuff so that is what we are doing today okay to design our stencil we're going to go to the design space program at design.cricut.com now you do need a username and a password for this and you can design lots of projects for free, but there are upgrades for a cost for certain projects or for special fonts, that kind of thing. So I've clicked into a new project and I have a blank canvas to start. Now my design is going to just be a quote, so I only need to create a couple of text boxes. So over on the left hand column, I'll click on text. That'll pop a text box up and I simply type in the text of my quote. And as I type, you're going to see the word show up on my canvas. Now, I want to change this font. So on the top left corner of the screen, I'll click on font and the whole menu opens up for me. Now you can scroll through and pick out what you like best, but I've actually already picked out my fonts. And for this part of the quote, I'm going to select the font Rusty. Now, if you look closely, you notice the little green A next to this font. That means it's part of Cricut Access, which is a premium service. So you would have to purchase an access plan to use this, but there are a ton of free fonts, so you do have options. So now is the uber creative part. What are you gonna put on your sign? You could do what I'm doing, use the same quote, the same fonts, but you really can create anything that you want. So tell everyone in the comments, just so we can all have some inspiration. Are you gonna put a quote, saying, something funny, maybe an image? I would love to hear what you're gonna do to customize your own sign and also let us know what fonts that you're feeling too. Okay, so I've changed my font. The next thing I'll do is drag the text box to the upper corner. Now the open space on my blank sign is just under 24 by 17 inches. So I want to size my stencil so it fits the sign, but with some margins all the way around. So up at the top menu, I'm gonna type in the exact width I want, and I'm going to make it 20 inches. So that will give me just about two inches of margin on each side of the final project. And just a quick, maybe obvious note, 
You notice the canvas is basically a ruler grid. This matches up to your actual measurements. In other words, when I line up my text with the ruler on the canvas to be 20 inches by roughly two inches, that's the actual size it'll cut for me later. Now you see on the finish sign that I have five separate lines here. So I actually have five separate text boxes that I'm going to make. One for the top line of the sign, one for the word that, one for the word paradise, one for the rest of the quote, and one for the guy who said it. So even though I plan to use the same font and sizing for multiple lines of my sign, I'm setting it up this way simply so I can space out each line the way I want. So to create a new text box, I could just click text again on the left. However, an easier way to do it is to copy and paste that first text box. That way I maintain both the size and the font that I just formatted. In this next box, I'll type the word that. Then I'll copy and paste a third time and change the text to the rest of my quote. For my fourth text box, I will click on the text layer on the left since I'm going to use a different font and a different size for this one. And I'll type in the word paradise. So right now it defaults to that rusty font because that's what I just used and I wanna change that. So clicking up under font across that top menu again, I'll go searching for a different font to highlight that word on my sign. I like the Monotype Gallia standard regular font, so I can type in part of that font name in the search bar and it'll show up and I just click it to change the text box. But you see the size is still a little too small. So I'm gonna drag that text box up next to the word that and then I can click and drag the lower right corner of the Paradise text box to size it up where I want it. You can play around with this until it's just where you want it, but I actually figured out the exact width that'll work before I started recording this. So I'm gonna type that into the width box at the top. It's 15.732, so it's pretty exact, but notice it doesn't go outside the D of the word imagined because that's my right margin limit and I'll keep playing with the spacing on the text boxes until it's laid out perfectly. Okay, just one more text box to create, and I'll click the text layer on that left side one more time to create a new box. It defaults to the last font that I used, which is the monotype, but I'll just type out Jorge Luis Borges. And once more at the top, pick out a different font. I really like the ITC Blaze Standard Italic. It looks almost handwritten. But what you notice right away is that when I type this in, the letters are all separated. And we want to shrink down the space between those letters and even connect some of them. So how to do that? Okay, with the text box still highlighted, we're gonna go up to the top right corner and click ungroup. And you see how that separates each letter and singles it out as its own element. So now I can just go letter by letter and squeeze these together using my arrow keys to move them over one by one. I like the look of the separated letters for the name Jorge, but you notice I connected the U and the I in Luis. So again, you can play with that and string letters out as wide or as tight as you want. This looks good. Okay, now we need to basically lock these letters into place. So over on the right hand side, we're gonna click on each letter of the author's name to select them all. And then on the bottom right, we'll click weld to attach them together. And now I can move the whole name around again as one unit, and it'll also cut as one solid unit. Now this placement of the quote is exactly how I want this to cut. It's spaced and sized perfectly. So I'm also going to attach this entire section together just so that I can maintain that when I go to cut this. And to do that, I just highlight each text box on the right to select them all. And at the bottom right hand corner, click attach. Okay, I also am happy with the general placement of the author's name on the canvas, but because this isn't attached to the rest of the quote, the machine will try to cut the vinyl in the most economical way, which will place the letters too close together. This will make sense later. So here's what we do. Select the name and click on that looped arrow on the top right corner, and we're going to rotate the text box 90 degrees. Then drag it up to line up with the rightmost margin of the quote. So I know I'm gonna be using a 12 by 24 inch mat to cut this, which means I have 24 total inches of space to work with. So I'll place this one and a half inches to the right of my quote to give myself some wiggle room, and then I'll click Command or Control A 
to select everything. And again, we go to the menu on the bottom right of the screen and click attach. And we are ready to cut our stencil. So up at the top right hand corner of the screen, click make it. Now this will bring up the cut preview, which looks perfect. And even though my author name is in the wrong place for how it's actually gonna appear on my sign, that is okay because I can just trim it off and place it separately. But at the top, it's alerting me that my image is bigger than 11.5 inches. Now that too is fine. It just means that I need a longer mat. So I'm gonna click okay and then click continue at the bottom. Now, just a quick note about mats. The Cricut comes with a couple of 12 by 12 inch mats, but we know that these aren't going to be big enough to create a stencil of the size that we need for this sign. So I need to opt for a mat that's twice the length. And I'm going to use the 12 by 24 inch light grip blue mat. Okay, let's get the vinyl ready for the cut. I'm using the Aura Mask 813 vinyl. So to help me measure this, I'm going to eyeball a piece just a little longer than my cutting mat. I'll explain why just a little later. And then using my paper trimmer, I'm sliding that vinyl through and slicing it off the roll. Next, I'll carefully line up that vinyl on the cutting mat. Now it's a little sticky so that the vinyl stays in place when we go to cut this. Now to connect my machine. So hit the power button and the computer will eventually detect it. Okay, before it'll start to cut, the program will prompt me to set up a few important details. First, it wants to know what kind of material I'm cutting. So I can click on browse all materials on the right and this will bring up a full list of options, but I can narrow this down. So I'm gonna click on all categories at the top and select vinyl. That'll bring up the options under vinyl and I'm just going to select premium vinyl and then click done. Next, the program will prompt me to make sure I have all the correct tools in place. Now, I don't need anything in clamp A, but I actually have the wrong blade in clamp B right now. It's telling me to load the fine point blade that comes with the machine into clamp B. But when I recorded this, I still had the deep cut blade from my St. Patrick's Day decor tutorial. So I'll link that in the cards and below if you wanna check that out, but I do need to swap this out. So to do that, I just open up clamp B, snap open the front, then fold out this inner rounded piece and the blade comes out pretty easily. Then just set the correct blade in its place, fold that inner piece back in and close up the clamp. And you do need to apply a little elbow grease to make sure that's snapped in place correctly. In addition, the star wheels, these small white rings, need to be evened out across this silver bar. Again, they were pushed over from my last project. Okay, time to load the mat. So I'll feed it into the machine and then press the blinking arrow button. Once the mat is loaded correctly, the screen will let me know and then it'll prompt me to press go, which just means I should press that little Cricut logo button and off it'll go and you'll be able to watch the progress on the screen. Once the cut is complete, I'll get a prompt to unload my mat. And to do that, I just press that blinking arrow button again and it'll roll right out. And with that, I can peel the vinyl off my cutting mat. Now, for whatever reason, and this should have been a premonition of what was to come later, I had a tough time pulling this off the mat. This hasn't ever happened before, but I'm wondering if it had anything to do with the fact that I had just cleaned the mat. I'm really not sure, but that's the only time I've ever had at all a difficult time peeling vinyl just off the mat. Okay, it is time to prep our vinyl for the stencil. And for that, I need to break out my weeder. This kind of looks like a tool that you would see in a dentist's office, but it's just like a little pick that'll help you weed out the parts of the stencil that you don't need. All right, I'm starting by trimming the author name off my vinyl. So using my paper trimmer again, I'm actually gonna slice that off. I know this is really difficult to see on camera, but you'll be able to see it in person. And doing this step just allows me to place the name of the author separately later on. And then I'm just gonna peel out the letters, being very careful to leave behind the exact outline of what I'm eventually going to paint on the sign. And here's how it should look when that step is done. Now I can move on to the main piece. So same rules, we're just peeling off the letters themselves, leaving behind the inner loops and the circles for the O's and the D's and the A's. Also, some of the fonts that I chose, especially the monotype for the word paradise, those can get kind of tricky since this is so detailed. So pay really close attention as you're doing this. 
Okay, now that I've weeded my stencil, I need to transfer it over to my wood sign for painting. And to do that, I'm using the appropriately named transfer tape. I have a whole roll of this, and I've had a lot of luck with this brand as well from Craftables. So I'm just going to trim two pieces off the roll that are the size of my stencils. And then I'm peeling off the paper backing and sticking this right over the stencil, making sure the entire thing is covered. So anything that I exposed with the weeder needs to be covered here. And also a heads up, you don't have to use transfer tape, although it does work really well. You could actually use masking tape or painter's tape for this step. Now I really need to make sure this tape is well attached. So I'm smoothing it out a bunch of times. And this is what it should look like when it's ready to be transferred. So the next step is to remove the paper backing of my vinyl. So you're going to carefully peel the paper off. And I like to fold the paper back 180 degrees so that I can easily see if any of the vinyl is coming off with the paper. If it is, I can just press the paper back down and try again. Same thing with the bigger stencil. I am slowly peeling back that paper backing and it'll be a little trickier on this piece because I have not just multiple lines of text, but also some more detailed fonts going on here. So proceed very carefully and take your time. And here is an example of the stencil coming up with my paper. So I'm just pressing it back down, smoothing it over with my hand to get it to attach to the transfer tape beneath and then continuing on. So this is what it should look like when you're done. Basically, it's a big sticker that now we're going to carefully attach to the wood sign. So line it up and place it exactly where you want it. Now I need to smooth this down really well. And for that, I'm using a scraper. This will help me release any air bubbles and ensure that it's well attached to the sign. Next, I'm gonna remove my transfer tape. So going very slowly once more, I'm peeling back the tape to reveal the stencil outline. And now my sign is ready to be painted. I'm using my chalked paint by Rust-Oleum in the shade Country Gray. I also used this paint for a recent project I did upcycling an Ikea shelving unit. I'll link that up here in the cards and below as well. Make sure that you stir this first and then using my sponge brush, I'm going to dab or stipple the paint all over the stencil. I would avoid using long brush strokes just because the lettering is pretty delicate and it'll be really easy to inadvertently get paint under the stencil, which you don't want since it would ruin your design. Another word to the wise, and I've gotten burnt on this before, pay close attention where you're applying that paint as you work along the edges of the stencil. It is really easy to accidentally paint outside the stencil since the margin is pretty small. Now I'm going to need to pull this up before I can put down my second stencil because it would overlap the other one. So I'm gonna to have to wait on that one for now, but this is where my big mistake comes in. I let the paint dry about 80% of the way and then it was time to peel off the vinyl. So everything started out fine, but as I continued toward the middle of the stencil, the blue paint started peeling off. So I tried going in from a different corner and then the vinyl started ripping. And then I went to another corner and at this point, I really thought this project was just shot. Guys, I was so bummed out and I still can't figure out exactly what caused this. The vinyl is non-permanent, so it's supposed to pull off really easily. Hardboard is totally paintable and chalk paint, in my experience, is very durable. So I still can't figure out exactly why this happened, but I'm thinking I might do a brand review down the road to test things out against one another. Maybe I can figure that mystery out. Just let me know down in the comments if that's something you'd be interested in. But as with most DIY projects, this was salvageable. So let me show you how I dealt with this. Well, all I could do at this point was continue with my second stencil. So that's what I did. I placed it painted it, and then peeled it off after letting it dry about 80% of the way. And the same thing happened. The vinyl pulled off some of the blue paint and ripped, so I had to go in with a weeder to pick out the remnants. So my magic ingredient to fix this will be another coat of the Rust-Oleum Smoked Glaze. If you watched the first part of this series, we used this on the blank sign when it was just blue paint. So I'm gonna go back over the whole thing again, lettering and all, and try to make this work. 
So you'll stir this up before you use it, just like we did the first time, and then using a synthetic brush, paint a layer over the entire sign. Now the whole point of this glaze is to give an aged, antiqued look. So I'm really hoping at this point that that's gonna make this look not so much like a huge blunder, but rather a piece of artwork that's been sitting in someone's attic for the last 60 years, and I just reclaimed it. And after I give this glaze a couple of minutes to soak in, I'm gonna take a rag and wipe off any excess. So I feel like this could have come out so much worse. Granted, I envisioned a clean design, but this super vintage aged look is still pretty awesome. So by all means, go into your projects with a plan, but keep an open mind should things go awry. <laughs> Final step is to attach some hardware, and I'm going to attach a sawtooth hanger. So using my tape measure, I'll find the center and flank it with the hanger, and then just apply some pressure just so I can mark the spots where I'm going to need to hammer this in. Now, I like to prep the holes with a nail first. That way, I'm less likely to end up with a crooked hanger. So I'm going to hammer the nail at the two spots I just marked just far enough that the sawtooth can nearly stand on its own. And then I'll set that sawtooth back in and hammer it into place. Quite the labor of love. But in the end, I actually like the flawed finished product better than what I had originally planned. Guys, if you liked this video, give it a like and share it with someone who might like it as well. And consider subscribing so that you don't miss any new videos, but I post them every single Thursday. Coming up, I'm getting ready to launch a DIY basics series, which will show you all sorts of beginner crafting techniques. I'm excited to get that started and you can ring the bell to get notified when those go live. Meanwhile, don't forget to grab your DIY must have checklist. You can grab that in the description below and also the shopping list for all of the tools and materials that were used in this tutorial. And in between uploads, I would love to hear from you. So drop me a note in the comments or message me over on social. And I have linked all of those pages in the description as well. Thanks as always for watching and I'll see you next Thursday. Well, let me show you how I dealt with it. And here you're fine. You, 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 you. Little, little bit shiny. And you know that I mentioned I had some trial and error. What the heck was that? portion of this project but today and a sawtooth is sawtooth <laughs> and a sawtooth oh hey Luis Borges oh yeah Jorge Luis Borges Borges 24 inch light grip blue <laughs> what caused this the pain this could have come out so much